In 15 AD, a new king came to the throne of the Atrobates of southern Britain. His name was Verica, and not only was he the brother of the previous king, Epilus, but he was also the son of Julius Caesar's one-time auxiliary cavalry commander, Commius, who had retired to Britain at the end of his life close to a century before. From his capital at modern-day Silchester, Verica had been well placed to rule over the prosperous realm of the Atrobates, one of the richest of the Celtic nations of Britain. At some point during his early reign, he was recognised as Rex by Rome, meaning he was legitimately recognised as a king, and as a result, he enjoyed good trade links and diplomatic ties with the empire. Little did he know it at the time, but this alliance with Rome, however innocent it seemed at the time, was about to change the face of Britain forever. The long-established balance of power which had existed between the various Celtic nations for centuries was about to drastically and catastrophically come to an end. Rome wasn't the only expansionist power in Northern Europe during this time. By around 25 AD, the Catavellani tribe, located in southeastern Britain, began to look westwards to expand their borders. The kingdom had been gradually expanding its power throughout this period and looked set to become the paramount force in the south of Britain. The rich lands of the Atrobates, situated to the west of their realm, seemed rich and ripe for the picking. Not to mention the fact that the Atrobates enjoyed good relations with the Romans, that race of people who less than a century before had taken their ships to the British coast and launched no less than two separate invasion attempts against the lands of the Catuvalani and their neighbours to the east. Cassivellaunus, the king who is said to have led much of the resistance effort against Caesar's invasions back in 54 and 55 BC, may have been of the Cativellani. The tribe had a long memory, and though they themselves traded with Rome, as evidenced by substantial archaeological evidence, they always knew that Rome could come back, and they wanted to be ready when it did. Upon the death of King Epitachus in 35 AD, the Cativellani expansion was halted for a time, and some lands were even reclaimed by the Atrobates. In 40 AD, however, a new king came to the throne. His name was Caraticus, and it is under him that the lands of his people would reach their absolute apex, expanding to such an extent they had the effect of attracting the attention of the old enemy from across the sea, who by chance had now mostly subjugated the formerly independent territories of Gaul and were themselves ready for expansion once more. By 43 AD, after Verica's lands had been taken, he himself expelled from Britain, Rome used the attacks on its ally as a pretext for their own invasion of the British mainland. It was an event which would erupt into a decades-long power struggle, culminating in the vast majority of Britain falling under the sway of Rome. For much of the early period of the conquest, Caraticus, the one-time conqueror, would turn freedom fighter using his noble blood as a tool with which he would travel throughout Britain, harrying the Romans at every turn, creating guerrilla bands of warriors everywhere he went, and providing a constant thorn in the side of the Roman invasion effort. Caratacus had likely been born in around 10 AD, as a son of the Catiovellanian king Cunobelinus. Upon the death of his father, his uncle Epitacus took the throne, and led his tribe to a succession of military victories against the Atrobates, and likely the other Celtic nations of Britain. Excavated coinage from this period suggests a friendly relationship between Caratacus and his uncle, who appears to have taken him under his wing and groomed him for eventual rule. After the death of Epitacus in around 35 AD, the Atrobates reversed some of the expansion into their lands, but ultimately could do little to withstand renewed attacks once Caratacus cemented his position as king. According to the Roman historian Dio, Verica, king of the Atrobates, was ousted and fled to Rome to seek aid from the Emperor Claudius, who subsequently used Verica's ousting as an excuse to invade Britain outright, ostensibly to restore his client king to power, but in reality to conquer new territories, secure Britain's lucrative tin and gold deposits, and to secure the northern borders of the empire. In the summer of 43 AD, Claudius's general, Aulus Plautius, landed his troops in Britain, arriving near to the Catavellanian stronghold of Camelundum at modern-day Colchester. Caratacus, along with his brother Sogodimnus, led the fight against the invaders. The Roman army is thought to have consisted of around four legions, consisting of around 20,000 men. It was also backed up by 20,000 auxiliary soldiers from allied peoples throughout the empire. Caratacus and his brother Togodimus 
led a brave but ultimately unsuccessful defence against the better equipped and highly organised invasion force. They tended to implement hit and run engagements, thus avoiding meeting the Romans in open battle wherever they could, knowing that in such a fight the Romans would be able to maximise their tactical and strategic advantages. Eventually however, Plautius managed to force his adversaries into open battle on two concurrent occasions, and as a result, the resistance crumbled away against the might of the Roman army. According to Dio, Togodemus was killed in battle near the Thames, and the territory of the Catibolani was annexed into the empire in the aftermath. Their former stronghold at Colchester became the new Roman seat of power in Britain, and the first colonia in the province, where an influx of Roman colonists from the mainland would now settle. Aulus Plautius became the first governor of the province, serving from 43 to 46 AD. And gradually, over those years, more and more former vassals of the Catuvellaini pledged their allegiance to Rome, effectively ending any prospect of organised resistance in the southeast of the country. Upon Plautius's recall to Rome in 46, however, a new man was sent to govern Britain in his place, Publius Astorius Scapula. Believing a new governor might be reluctant to campaign so late in the year, and sensing potential weakness during his handover period, uprisings and attacks took place all over the Roman occupied zone and beyond, in the still independent regions bordering it. Little did the Roman commanders in the southeast know that one of the princes of the Catuvellaini, Caraticus, had not only survived the war, but he had continued to rouse support against Rome wherever he could. He spent the years after his defeat travelling amongst the various tribes of Britain, attempting to raise support against the Romans. His aims were not entirely selfless of course, as he wished to reclaim his throne, as well as rid the island of the invaders. Soon enough he was taken in by the still independent Celtic tribes of Wales. The next time Caraticus appears in the written record is in the late 40s, when he is named as a prominent leader fighting with the Silures and Ordovices of Wales against the new governor of Britannia. By 51 AD, in a vast set-piece battle somewhere in the territory of the Ordovices, Scapula managed to defeat the Celtic coalition. They had made their stand in a specifically planned mountainous location, which offered the maximum possible advantage to the Celts. Undaunted, the Roman professional army triumphed nonetheless, and Caraticus was defeated once more. This time, his wife and daughter were captured, and his surviving brothers surrendered. Caraticus again escaped, however, and made his way north to the lands of the Brigantes, in an attempt to raise yet another army to fight once more against the Romans. The queen of these lands, however, was Cartus Mandua, an intelligent and ambitious queen who realised the way that the wind was blowing. In late 51 AD, Rather than offer sanctuary to the rebel king, Cartus Mandua decided to hand Caraticus over to the Romans in chains, rather than support him and risk losing everything her people had. This act was unpopular at the time, and led to two ultimately unsuccessful Brigante revolts over the next two decades. Nevertheless, the dice had been thrown, and Caraticus was transported to Rome in chains to be displayed at the triumph of Claudius essentially a public parade celebrating the Emperor before his eventual fate of being quietly executed, as usually happened with defeated rulers. Just a century earlier, the defeated Gallic king, Vercingetorix, had suffered a similar fate at the triumph of Julius Caesar, but not before being kept chained up in a Roman dungeon for years, until he was finally publicly displayed like an animal and strangled in his cell. As he contemplated his fate on his long journey to Rome, Caraticus would likely have expected the same undignified end as the famous Gallic king. With Caraticus removed from the equation, the Celts in Britain no longer had a charismatic leader to rally behind, and as a result, much of southern Britain from the Humber to the Severn became pacified and garrisoned throughout the 50s, as more and more tribes submitted to Rome. Caraticus had one more trick up his sleeve, before he was to be killed, he was allegedly allowed to speak before the Senate. The historian Tacitus attributes a rousing speech to him, wherein he applauded Rome, but also argued for his own life. The speech apparently made such an impression on Claudius, that Caraticus' sentence was commuted from death. He was never allowed to return to Britain, but he was allowed to live out the rest of his days in peace in Rome. Reportedly, the once rebellious king became Romanized in just a few short years yet he still occasionally questioned why such a great city so coveted the relatively poor lands of Britain. If the 
degree of my nobility and fortune had been matched by moderation and success, I would have come to this city as a friend rather than a captive, nor would you have disdained to receive with a treaty of peace, one sprung from brilliant ancestors and commanding a great many nations. But my present lot, disfiguring as it is for me, is magnificent for you. I had horses, men, arms, and wealth. What wonder if I was unwilling to lose them? If you wish to command everyone, does it really follow that everyone should accept your slavery? If I were now being handed over as one who had surrendered immediately, neither my fortune nor your glory would have achieved brilliance. It is also true that in my case, any reprisal will be followed by oblivion. On the other hand, if you preserve me safe and sound, I shall be an eternal example of your clemency.